Ephesians 6, 14, having your loins girt about with truth. What is truth here, he says? Some say it is Christ himself who is called the truth in John's gospel. But in this passage, the apostle assigns distinct meanings to several pieces of armor, and Christ cannot be confined to any one of them. Instead, he is the whole in whom we are complete compared to the entire suit of armor put on the Lord Jesus Christ in Romans 13, 14. Others think the apostle is implying truth of doctrine or uh, sincerity. And indeed, both are necessary to make the girdle complete. And neither one will work without the other. It is possible, of course, to have a kind of sincerity without truth. For instance, God did not sanction Saul's zeal when he persecuted the Christian church, although he earnestly believed he was doing God a favor, Saul did. And neither is it enough to have truth on our side if it is not in our hearts. Jehu defiantly opposed idolatry, but later tore down his testimony by hypocrisy. Both then are vitally essential. <clears throat> Sincerity to set forth a right purpose and knowledge of the word of truth <clears throat> to direct us toward that end. <clears throat> what is meant by loins? Peter interprets Paul, gird up the loins of your mind, 1 Peter 1.13. They are our spirit and mind which wear this girdle of truth. The loins are to the body as the keel is to the ship. Because the whole vessel is connected to this keel, it is sustained by it, and the body is knit to the loins. If the loins fall, the entire body sinks. Even when we get tired physically, nature prompts us to support both hands on our loins as our primary strength. Thus, to smite through the loins is a phrase of destruction. Weak loins make a weak man. Therefore, as the actions of our minds and spirits are powerful or passive, so we are strong or weak Christians. If a person's understanding is clear in its hold on truth and his will is sincerely grounded in holy purposes, then he is a maturing Christian. But if the understanding is uncertain and the will is wavering and unsteady, the man is dull and his life is one of spiritual impotence. Truth of doctrine for the mind, truth of heart or sincerity for the will, unite and establish both these faculties. And this is exactly what happens when they are fastened firmly around the soul as the girdle about the loins of the body. Although the loins are the strength of the body, they need help from the girdle to keep those parts inseparable in their force. So, Roman number one, truth of doctrine as a girdle for the mind. We shall begin with truth of doctrine, called the word of truth because it is the word of God, who is himself the God of truth. Peter warned us to resist the devil steadfast in the faith, that is, in the truth. The word faith is used here as the object of our faith, which is the truth of God. And in the following verse, Peter ver earnestly prays for God to establish, strengthen, settle you. The, the concentration of these different expressions, all leading to the same purpose, implies the dangerous, unsettling potential of Satan and the necessity of standing unshaken in the faith against him. In the volatile times of the early church, it was impossible for Christians to keep the faith from being torn away from them without this girdle to hold it close. Just as the devil has a, a double design to rob Christians of truth, so there are two sides of being girded with this grace. First, Satan comes as a serpent in the persons of false teachers to cheat us with error for truth. To defend ourselves against his conspiracy, we must be girded with truth in our understanding and have established judgment in the truths of Christ. And second, Satan comes as a lion in the role of persecutors who strive to separate saints from the truth through fear of danger and death. The only way to defend ourselves against this lion is to be girded with truth 
and thus maintain our profession of faith in every circumstance. Established judgment in the truths of Christ is the next topic. Since Satan comes as a serpent, concealed in false teachers and tries to deceive us with error for truth, every Christian needs an established judgment in the truths of Christ. The Bereans studied scripture to satisfy their judgments concerning the doctrine Paul preached. They refused to believe anything he had said before they searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. They took the preacher's doctrine straight to the written word and compared it to that, and the result was, therefore, many of them believed. As the Bereans dared not believe before, they could not help but believe now. Tertullian described the preaching of heretics like this. They teach by persuading and do not by teaching persuade. That is, they court the emotions of their hearers without convincing their judgment. For instance, it would be hard for an adulterer to convince his companion that her prostitution is lawful. Instead, he works another way, by romantic overtones and appeal to the flesh. The question of law is soon forgotten. Judgment is easily and quickly absorbed by burning lust. Thus error, like a thief, comes in through the window, and yet truth, like the owner of the house, enters at the door of understanding, and from there moves into the conscience, will, and affections. The man who finds and professes truth before he understands its excellency and beauty, cannot fully appreciate the worth of its heavenly birth and descent. A prince, traveling in disguise, is not honored because people do not realize who he is. Truth is loved and prized only by those who recognize it and know it personally. If we do not desire to know truth, we have already rejected it. It is not hard to cheat a person out of truth if he does not know what he has. Truth and error are all the same to the ignorant man, and and so he calls everything truth. Have you heard about the covetous man who constantly hugged his many bags of gold? He never opened them or used the treasure. And thus, when a thief stole the gold and left his bags full of pebbles in his room, He was as happy as when he still had the gold. Next topic, why Christians need an established judgment in the truth. First, protection from the damning nature of false doctrines. An abscess in the head can be as deadly as one in the stomach, and a corrupt judgment in foundation truths kills as surely as a rotten heart does. Many people say a person can be saved in any religion if he just follows the light. It does not matter, they say, what you believe as long as you believe something. But their imagination is making as many roads to heaven as Scripture tells us there are ways to hell. This humanistic rationale may sound good, but the end of it does not lead to Christ, who says there is no other way to life but by him. I am the way, the truth, and the life. John declares that anyone who will not hold the one true doctrine of Christ is marked eternally as a lost man. And he who will not take God before he dies, the devil will take as soon as he dies. No matter how much kindness and logic and religion a man mixes in to corrupt true doctrine, he is an obstinate sinner in God's sight and will receive the same condemnation at Christ's hands as the unrepentant drunkard or murderer. Both stand tied together for hell. They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If ignorance in fundamentals is damning, surely error in fundamentals is far more deadly. If a pound of sin is enough to press down to hell, there is no doubt that a ten-pound weight will do it even faster. Error stands farther away from truth than ignorance does and opposes it more vigorously. Error is 
ignorance with an unseen guillotine. A man who does not eat enough will die, but the one who swallows poison will lose his life even sooner. The apostle assures us that pernicious ways and damnable heresies bring swift destruction upon those who accept them. All rivers find their way sooner or later to the sea, but some return with a swift stream and get there before the others. If you want a shorter trip to hell, then you could schedule with more conventional sin. Then slide into this rushing river of corrupt doctrine, and it will not take long for you to get there. Two, uh, protection from the subtle nature of imposters. Because wicked imposters are skillful enough to destroy faith, we must strengthen our judgment in the truths of Christ. The apostle describes the victims of these sorcerers as people who are ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. But to faithful Timothy, he says, but thou hast fully known my doctrine. It is as if he had said, I am not worried about you. You are too fully persuaded to be cheated out of the gospel now. Seducers then wait for unsettled men to stumble into the devil's snare because they do not stand on scriptural ground. In vain, the net is spread in the sight of any bird. Proverbs 117. The devil chose to attack Eve instead of Adam because she was the one more likely to be caught. And he has varied his strategy very little since then. He still sneaks over where the hedge is the lowest and the resistance the weakest. Let us look now at three kinds of people who fit into this category. A. Simple ones. Seducers. By pleasing words and convincing speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. These people mean well, but they lack discernment. They carelessly drink from just anybody's cup, and they never suspect they are being slowly poisoned. Be children. Be no more children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. And because children assume anything is good if it is sweet, it's not hard to tempt them to eat poison for sugar. Because a child does not have much knowledge of the word for himself, he is swayed by the slightest suggestion, good or bad. Like Isaac, children bless their opinions by feeling and not by sight, and thus fall into the pit of deception because they have not tried their feelings by the truths of God's word. And then, unstable. The simple ones, the children, the unstable. False teachers are successful in beguiling unstable souls. Second Peter 2.14 Those whose understanding is not anchored in the word. These unstable people are at the mercy of the wind and drift further and further down the stream of fashionable religious phenomena and other current trends, much like dead fish in the tide. And then, number three, universal influence of established judgment upon the whole man. Let us examine uh, three vital areas. A, memory. The memory is the treasury which stores up and carries images which we have received. The more weight applied to the seal, the deeper the impression made on the wax. And the more emphatic and certain our knowledge of something, the more deeply it sinks into the memory. B. Affections. The more steady the glass of understanding is, where the light of truth is beamed upon our affections, the sooner they are set on fire. Luke twenty four thirty two says, Did not our heart burn within us while he opened to us the scriptures? The disciples were asking that on the Emmaus Road. No doubt they had already heard Christ preach what he was saying now, but they had never been so completely satisfied as when he opened their understanding and scriptures together. The sun sends influence and warmth into the earth, even when the light does not shed visible beams upon it. But the sun of righteousness 
He gives his influence only where his light comes to spread truth into our understanding. And as a Christian abides under these wings, a kind of heart-quickening heat is kindled in his heart. While the Holy Spirit is a comforter, he is also a convincer. He comforts us by teaching us. And then see life and behavior. The eye directs the foot. A man cannot walk safely unless he can see where he is going. Nor can he walk when the earth quakes under his feet. The principles we have in our understanding are the ground our behavior moves upon. If they shift, our actions will stagger too. It is as impossible for a shaking hand to write a straight line as it is for a faltering judgment to exhibit acceptable behavior. The apostle links steadfastness and unmovableness with abounding in the work of the Lord. The gospel came to the Thessalonians in much assurance, that is, in evidence of its truth. And notice how it prevailed in their everyday lives. Quote, you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. They were assured that this doctrine was from God, and that assurance carried them through times of affliction as well as rejoicing.